This is our moment. This week's Torah portion, as I've mentioned so many times tonight already, Bishalach, recounts the central moment in our people's narrative, the precise moment that the Israelites take their first steps as a truly free people. While they may have began the journey at the end of last week's Torah portion, we read in the opening lines of this week that Pharaoh, whose heart yet again has hardened once more, reverses course and commands his troops to pursue the Israelites before they completely escape. This is the story we recall when we recite the words of Vea Hafta, which we did tonight, when we sing with joy our prayer of freedom, taken straight from the Torah this week, Micha Mocha, we acknowledge this freedom from Egypt, from slavery in Egypt, when we sing our Kiddush on Shabbat. We are constantly bringing to mind this story, the story of our liberation. It's often recalled as the source of our strength, a reminder of the power and possibility of change, of transformation. It serves to highlight the power of community and much, much more. And here we are this week reading it from our Torah. This is our moment. You will not be surprised to learn that your rabbis, both ancient and modern, have searched for meaning in these words from the Exodus. But they've also added more texts, stories of their own creation called Midrash, as they attempt to place themselves in the Israelite shoes. One of the most famous Midrashim, famous stories created about this moment from Shemot Rabbah reads, it was precisely at the moment when they went down into the seabed and found it full of mud because it was still wet from the water that there were two Israelites, Ruvain and Shimon, who were among the people. And as they walked through the sea, all they could talk about was the mud. Ruvain said, in Egypt we had mud, and now in the sea we have mud? In Egypt we had clay for bricks, and here too we have an abundance of clay to make bricks. They rebelled at the sea, even when this was the parting of the Sea of Reeds, the Midrash says. It continues, they didn't notice the water that was separated around them. They only saw the mud. This is a story I had heard so many times, and the message usually derived from it, this Midrash thought to be composed in the 11th or 12th century, is one of, don't forget to look up. Don't get stuck in the mud, only to miss the everyday miracles surrounding you. Don't be Ruvain and Shimon. And don't get me wrong, that's a beautiful message. But I feel like it's missing one element of the story. The incredible fear that they must have felt in that moment. We'll come back to that in a moment, but... What I'm about to ask you isn't the nicest thing to do on Shabbat because I'm going to ask you a question that may stir up a memory that may be prickly or cold or uncomfortable. But when was a time that you felt truly afraid and scared? And unfortunately, I know all of us have had those moments. And it may also seem like a cruel qu question to ask right now, nearly a year into living through a pandemic when fear permeates our lives in such a way that we've almost accepted it as a companion in life right now. But I want you to think of a particular moment where you felt afraid, however you would define that, at any point in your life. What did it feel like? How did you feel in that moment? Each year as we reread and study every word of Torah, I find myself needing to be constantly reminded of the fear that accompanied the Israelites through their lives in Egypt and that followed them into their wanderings in the desert. Before the Israelites have even made it to the shores of the Red Sea, before the sea has even parted, before they can walk across on dry land to true freedom, they see the Egyptians coming after them. They hear the hooves of the horses, they hear the wheels of the chariots, and they panic. And they ask three questions of Moses. They ask, was it for want of graves that you brought us here to die in the wilderness? They ask, what have you done to us taking us out of Egypt? They ask, is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt, saying, let us be and we will serve the Egyptians, for it is better to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness? 
We hear this today and think, oi vey, those ungrateful Israelites, how could they take freedom for granted from moment one? Oh, what an idiot. But this year I read it and I think, wow, they were so afraid. It's so easy to write this off as their selfishness or lack of vision. After all, they had just witnessed firsthand God's might through the ten plagues. They achieved freedom from slavery. And the Torah does not record their discussions as they walked away from Egypt, few belongings in hand of how incredible it was that after centuries of bondage, they were the generation to be freed. Not even the rabbis who come after have written those midrashim that I have found. This is a people with generational trauma from centuries of enslavement being asked to follow a God who was silent for so much of their suffering. Sometimes the fear we hold of the known seems more bearable than the fear of the unknown. So how does Moses respond to this fear, respond to these questions that they ask out of their fear? He says, Altira'u, do not fear. Now, I don't know about you, but how many times has someone telling you not to be afraid or not to be worried or not to be nervous or anxious, how many times is someone telling you, don't be afraid, actually calmed your nerves? How many times has someone said that to you and you thought to yourself, huh, Okay, then, I, I guess I'm not scared anymore. I, I'd venture to say never. And the thing is, though, that's not all Moses says, thankfully. He doesn't just say that and expect them not to be afraid anymore. His response, along with God's immediately following this moment, according to Rabbi Alan Liu, provides us with a checklist for responding to fear in a productive way. He defines the steps as follows with these five verbs that were said by Moses and God. Moses starts, Al tira'u, do not fear, or understood another way, stop running away from your fear. Notice it. Hit yatzvu, collect yourself, stand still, Moses says next. Rebuild yourself, ground yourself in the moment. Or u, see, try to evaluate the experience as it is, what is real, and what is imagined fear? Taharishun, a different word for be still. Ground yourself. And then God adds the fifth verb, the yisa'u. It's time to get going, move forward, make a choice. Rabbi Lu says when we find ourselves in a terrible dilemma and we are appropriately frightened, we know something must be done, but we have no idea what. This terrifies us. So what do we do? He says, we follow these five steps. Feeling stuck is only temporary. We can move. One of the most famous Jewish teachings about fear comes, comes from Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav, an 18th century th thinker who is credited with saying, kol ha'olam kulo gesher tsar ma'od v'hayikar lo lefached klal. Words that have been put to music and sung throughout the world, you may be singing it to yourself right now, translated as the whole world is a very narrow bridge, and the most important thing is not to be afraid. When I've studied this with our high school students, there's always someone who points out the absurdity of it saying the most important part is not to be afraid. After all, it is natural, a natural human instinct, one evolved for survival, no less, of course fear is part of life. You can't just tell yourself, don't be afraid. And so my high school students often interpret this as saying, don't let fear keep you from moving forward. But lo and behold, I find out after teaching this text just last year to our seniors who are now freshmen in college, hello everyone, that this lyric is actually an interpretation of what Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlav wrote in his writing, Likutei Moharan. What he actually wrote was vidasha adam tsarich la avor gesher tsar maod maod vahakla la vahai kar shalo lahit pached klal, meaning know that a person will have to cross a very, very narrow bridge and that the rule 
the key principle is not to frighten yourself at all. In this version, the verb for fear is different. It uses the reflexive form, indicating that we should not make ourselves afraid. We should not add to our fear. Perhaps, maybe, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov is referencing this five-step process to turn paralyzing fear into moving forward. That is what we can learn from our Torah. And so we return to the Midrash of Ruvain and Shimon. We take their fear into account this time. We can imagine the mud starting to cake on the bottom of their sandals. With each step they took, their feet sinking in a little more firmly into the water-saturated ground, packed in a seabed with a narrow path forward between two walls of water, among over a million people, all while hearing the horses and chariots of Pharaoh in pursuit of them and their people. It's overwhelming to consider what they may feel what they may have felt like on a different level we understand that feeling of having no good choice no guarantee just a leap we have to take perhaps them focusing on the mud in this midrash is their way of saying i'm stuck i'm scared i don't know what to do i don't know what lies ahead maybe what was before was good and we can imagine moses and god responding to them Alti ra'u, yes, you are afraid. Do not let it paralyze you. Hit yatsvu, yes, you can feel the mud pulling you down. Or u, yes, you can see. We are in a tight spot. That is real. Tacharishun, but pick your feet up out of the mud, and you'll have to do it again and again and again and again. In order to viyasu, vayisa'u, to move forward. I like to think Ruvain and Shimon made it through with the rest of the Israelites, that they did not remain behind, but that they reached the shore and ended up singing with the Israelites a song of relief, a song of acknowledging the fear they had that they were able, they had going into that moment, and acknowledging that they were too were able to move forward anyway. We too will have that moment we are living with so much fear right now. Let's acknowledge that, but also acknowledge that we're still moving forward. Can you hear at zone? May it be God's will. <laughs>